Welcome, everybody, to the Cone of Shame Veterinary Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Andy Rourke. Guys, I got a great one today. I am here with my friend, Dr. Indu Mani. Indu is the Chief Scientific Officer at Brief Media, the uh, the editor of Clinician's Brief Journal, and an associate veterinarian. She is also a fellow in bioethics at the Harvard Medical School. She is She's amazing. I saw that my friend Indu had written an article on moral distress in veterinary medicine, and she laid out what that means. And guys, this episode meant a lot to me because I have tried to explain this to people so many times. Um, veterinary medicine has unique challenges, and Indu really puts her finger on what they are and names them moral distress. And I, I just, I think, I think her wording is so good, and I think her understanding of of exactly what this means and the ethical implications for veterinarians is so good and so useful in us figuring out how we're going to go forward and how we're going to make our profession better. So, guys, that's what we get into. I love this episode. I hope you will love it too. Let's get into it. This is your show. We're glad you're here. We want to help you in your veterinary career. Welcome to the Cone of Shame with Dr. Andy Rourke. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Indumani. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. <laughs> oh, man. I, I, first of all, I am such a huge fan of yours, and I'm so glad that you make time for me. Uh, you are the best. For those who don't uh, know you, what is your official title at, uh, at Brief Media? Um, I'm Chief Scientific Officer at Brief Media, um, that bit publisher of Clinician's Brief, Plums Veterinary Drugs, um, yeah. the new Plums Pro. Yeah, the new Plums Pro is exciting. Yeah. It's a super yeah. cool little product you guys are putting out. Yeah, you and I met, I hate to even say this, it's probably yeah. been like 10 years ago. It's been a really long time. It's been a long time. Yeah. And I was uh, I was doing some work over at Brief Media, which I which I loved. And there are great people over there. And I was super, I we, still look back. We love you. We love oh, you. Oh, man. I was, um, that was like the first sort of real consulting job I ever got was with Beth Green at Brief Media. And she sort of gave me a chance. And I've never... Uh, Never forgiven her. Never, never stop thanking her for uh, for for taking a chance and letting me write some stuff and do some stuff with her. Um, it but anyway, sweet. it was all our our benefit. Well, thank to you. Have man. you there, Andy? You uh, you wrote an article for the New York Post that the New, York, New York Daily News, New yeah. York Daily News, oh, yeah, yeah, New York Daily News, which kind of went uh, sort of viral in the vet world. I saw it a bajillion different places. And, uh, and so I, that's when I picked it up as I saw it on social media, it came across my feed a couple of times. I was like, what is this? And then I saw, oh, wait, this is, Indy wrote this. And, uh, and you talk a bit about moral distress in veterinary medicine. And, and so as I sort of un, unpacked this and I read through it, I, I, I have strong feelings about, about what you wrote and I, I want to get into them with you. But first, can you tell me a little bit about how you came to be thinking in this area? I know you're doing some work, um, in the field of medical ethics and during the advanced training there. Can you sort of lay out your background and kind of how you started to get your head into this place? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a atypical background as a veterinarian. Um, I, being of Indian origin, my parents wanted me to go to medical school, of course. And so I disappointed <laughs> them greatly by going to veterinary medical school, but th they're happy with it now. Um, I graduated from Colorado State University. I did an internship at the University of Minnesota after that decided I wanted to work for the CDC, um, applied to a doctoral degree in virology at Harvard, got in, did finish that, and then, you know, decided at that point that I wanted to have children. And, um, and then so went into medical publishing and medical writing uh, and science writing rather than creating science, writing about it. Yeah. And um, that, that seemed to be a better fit. Throughout all this, I've always, I've continued to work in the small animal um, clinical practice situation, whether I was doing emergency or urgent care or primary care. So throughout this entire time, I've been an active small animal veterinarian. I would uh, I got involved with clinicians brief and publishing. And I would say about two years ago, there are certain things that I think I took for granted as a veterinarian, certain feelings, certain okay. client relations, just dealing with things that were upsetting. And I, I started to look around a little bit at, at ways of coping in a very, and let's just say coping in a very broad, amorphous way. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. With the, with the stresses sort of engendered by being a veterinarian, not really understanding what 
what that was. Yeah, I and, think most. I think most of us. You have. I think most of you in practice have those feelings of like. Yeah. Yeah, of that sort of stress, and and, and I think we wrestle to put a, a label on it. So I, I think the amorphous yeah. feelings yeah. Are, are pretty pretty yeah. common among us. And if you're like me, and I don't know, Andy, what you what you guys had, we had one ethics course um, taught by the late legend Bernie Rollin at Colorado State, um, uh, more of an animal ethics course, having us consider, you know, companion animals, food animals, etc. Not so much focused um heavily on what we feel as practitioners Mm -hmm. and um we didn't have any courses in psychology just some random i don't know whether you guys had a little bit more when you were in vet school i I mean i i it was it was still fairly minimal i i think uh i think when i was in vet school the the main focus sort of from a well-being standpoint was starting to be student debt and so that i think that was starting to unpack and i kind of feel like it we went through a student debt wave, and that's still, that problem hasn't gone away. Oh, but, I know. Yeah. But I feel like it's it's been the last probably five to six years that that there's really been a shift over to exactly. well being uh, being taught in vet schools. Yeah, and and so pa- armed with that kind of dearth of training, yeah. um, I started thinking about what makes us different because I living in the Boston area, I know a lot of physicians, a lot of nurses, a lot of people who have really stressful jobs, Mm -hmm. um, psychologists, but there's something different about being a veterinarian. And I couldn't really put my finger on it um, at all. And why, why we kind of accept living in this soup per se, where we have these feelings that we don't really understand. Yeah. In the, in the process of doing that, I, Lisa Moses, she's a veterinary internist. Um, she is at Angel Memorial, and she's a she's someone we referred cases to on a regular basis. Uh, so we knew her. She's mm-hmm. an incredible doctor, incredible person. She was the head of the pain and palliative service. And I noticed that she had been doing some co-associated research on ethics and moral distress. Uh, moral distress was sort of an emerging emerging thing for her at that mm-hmm. time. So basically a field of veterinary ethics. And I reached out to her. We talked. She had done a fellowship in bioethics at the Harvard Medical School. And I I talked to her, discussed what she was studying, what she was doing. And she said, you know, I'm the only veterinarian that has done this program, the pioneer veterinarian. You should apply <laughs> as a practitioner. And so, so I did. And um, I think transformative is a euphemism for the experience of being in this fellowship. Yeah. It was incredible. My classmates are about 12 of us. My classmates were, there was an attorney, several psychologists, psychiatrists, um, neonatologists, anesthesiologists. And um, it was, we would get together once a week um, and talk. We had a bioethics curriculum. We'd have readings. And it was so amazing because I always had the 13th perspective. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Everybody else had a more common experience with bioethics in the clinical situation, except for me, who yeah. always had a weird experience being a veterinarian, right? Well, yeah, I I, I love I love to hear that. And, and it fits. It fits with, with kind of, I guess yeah. what I'm sort of seeing in the world. You know, the reason... I wanted to, I was so, I was so grabbed by sort of what you wrote and, and the concept of moral ethics when you, uh, moral distress when you put it down. Yeah. And the reason is because, you know, um, I wrestled for years trying to explain, and even really understand for myself, the nuances of the challenges of our profession. And, and I'm really been going through this thing recently where I, I, I'm pushing back against this, um, this narrative sort of this put forward of like, Veterinary medicine is the worst for mental health, and I understand why. Why we say that, I, I think I think a lot of people struggle, right? We have a real burnout problem. Absolutely. We have a real uh, sort of problem with with depression and and just uh, compassion fatigue. All those things, they're all real, and I'm not I'm not discounting them. And I feel like I, I think most of us struggle to articulate what we're really feeling with. We just know it feels really bad, or that we've had these real significant challenges. And so I I, I think that the shorthand is. Oh, vet medicine is the worst. We have this mental health, you know, nightmare. Uh, it's 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 um, it's just so damaging. And I push back against that just because I want to articulate the nuance of our struggle in in a truthful way 
that it's also not leaving people feeling hopeless. And I, and I feel like yeah. your, your piece on moral distress really does that. I, um, you know, there's this, I, I have, I had this, did a podcast a, a while back with Jen Brandt uh, from the AVMA. It was really great. But I got myself in trouble on social media because I, we, we put the podcast out and I posted a pull quote that basically said, hey, you know, tr- truth matters. Um, veterinary medicine is not the worst mental health profession. And, and that's true. That's never been put forward. No one said that. The CDC didn't say that. It's a thing that sort of came up on social media and people start to say, oh, well, we're the worst. We have it the worst. And I, again, I, I think I think that, comes from people trying to articulate what they're feeling. Right. I got sort of in trouble because when I say, hey, look, it's not the worst, stop thinking it's the worst, that feels very dismissive of people and their struggles. And I go, well, that's not what I wanted to do either. So I, I, I missed, I, 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 that was a mistake on my part. But I do believe, I, I believe that we have unique challenges. We do. I, I don't think that was a mistake, Andy. I think you, I think this is a very difficult thing to unpack. Yeah. And, you know, I, there's a trend now I'm going to get myself in trouble. Um, <laughs> there's a there's a perception when people start to examine this that I started to notice, and I think mm-hmm. what you're saying maybe is a little bit in line with what I'm what I'm going to try to articulate. Okay. But there's a perception of individual agency, meaning that we tend to select people, the individuals that encompass this profession have an aptitude towards this type of situation. Or we either select people who are trait perfectionists or we select people who are who have trauma or we have and I'm not sure the data bears that out. And I think we need to look to the institution to see why this is happening and not look to its individual members. Okay, uh, I, I want to get into this. So, so let's start to unpack this. I, I think in order to talk about this, let, let's talk about moral distress. And we have to put that down. And then I want to come back to this individual agency because it's, it's yeah. definitely something I want to talk about. Okay, can you define for me moral distress for people who haven't seen yeah. the article? I, I have a link to the article in the show notes, but uh, go ahead and, and, and lay it out for me. What is moral distress and how is that different from burnout or just general, um, I don't know, depression uh, yeah. being being tired? Yeah, yeah. Moral distress is an ethical framework, right? It was coined by Andrew Jameson, a philosopher, in 1984, so a very long time ago, um, with respect to nurses, which, if you think about it, nurses are, are, are the population who, you know, embodies this. Moral distress is when you have to perform an action, you either feel compelled to perform an action, or you have to perform an action, or you don't... You, you you perform an action which is the opposite of what you feel is right. So it's a very simple definition. What you feel is morally correct. So yeah. if we were doing an extreme example, convenience euthanasia would be an example yeah. where we would feel a tremendous moral distress. You know, you see a, yeah, I don't know, a two-year-old adorable pit bull, you know, who's yeah. in the shelter and you've got to euthanize it. That is classic moral distress. Yeah, That's extreme. But it is it is that very hard to define sort of liminal sensation um, when that happens. What's also important, I think, to um, with that definition is the definition of moral injury, which I think um, that's like a really potent, maybe something that a war veteran might experience on the battlefield, you know, a potent, morally injurious event. So take that moral distress, concentrate it, you know, into a really painful event. And that's like a morally injurious event. Then there's a graphic, and I think it's a 2009 paper by Epstein. I'll I'll send it to you. But it's so biological because it talks about moral distress and then moral residue. So waves of moral distress that keep occurring over time and it leaves a residue. And that just really connected with me for veterinarians, what we experience. And then over time, biologically, the set point of moral residue, it just slowly and incrementally increases. Yeah. I'm imagining, I'm imagining almost like a water line, you know, where you have uh, waves that kind of wash up against and the the salt on the on the on whatever on the building that's it, it just kind of the salt exactly. line gets higher and higher over time. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly it. 
I mean, that's a perfect example. It's, it's what, what is tolerable resets, you know, it, 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 you almost adapt to living in this negative environment, but it's not a positive adaptation. Yeah. It's kind yeah. of a negative adaptation, you know? So, so let's get, let's get into this personal autonomy part. Cause I'm really interested in that. Are different people affected by moral distress differently? Do they feel it differently? And when I say different people, is it personality types? I, I, I guess my question to you is, do the perfectionist personalities among us, are they more bothered because it, they feel more clearly that, that there is a right way or, or I'm not living up to the perfect standard and that adds to the moral distress that I feel as opposed to someone who still wants to do a good, who obviously wants to do a good job, um, but but that level of perfection doesn't drive it. Or are those totally different things? And you say, no, whether you're perfectionist or not, you still feel the same moral discomfort. Yeah, that I'd say that's probably, I think, I mean, I'm I'm in my infancy in my ethics training, but that's that's what I'd say, that moral distress will occur no matter your personality type. How you deal with it might be affected by by your personality type. Um, I work with someone who's extraordinarily resilient. He's a resilient, resilient person. Okay. And um, he has dealt with really concrete, concretely distressing issues over time through his career. He is someone that I think, you know, I don't know if he can articulate why he's able to to consider, think about it, recognize it, move past it. You know, I, I think I think most of us don't talk about it. In yeah. this way. And that's the problem. That's the problem is we have to start talking about it. And for me personally, if we all, I'm sure we can all define things that provide distress for us. For me, it's being forced to perform non beneficial or futile care yeah. on some of our patients or not being able to perform care on our patients. And my own theory that I'm kind of working on is that because animals, you know, in many ways are property, mm -hmm. um, how do we how do we work on shared decision making models that empower the veterinarian to be able to articulate what they think is right for their patient? Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I think I think. I think the first part of, the, of the, all this is is getting our terms down and and, and all yeah. talking about the same thing, and that's why I was just I was so I was so taken with with what you wrote and just under, understanding moral distress. So yes. um, I, I completely agree with you. I think I think to me when I think about moral distress, I, I'll, so much of it boils down to the fact that we know what is the right thing to do, say the morally right thing to do, but right. we don't have the agency to necessarily carry those things out. And what I mean by that is I can't make the pet owner take their pet to surgery. I can't make the pet owner, um, you know, go to the emergency clinic for overnight monitoring. I can't make them do any of those things. And so when I think about moral distress, yes, I mean, I have heard, uh, honestly, when you said moral injury, the, the things that come to my mind is I know veterinarians who were forced to do procedures they didn't want to do. And to me, that that feels the, like that next level, like that moral injury. And I said, these people carry scars years later oh, that I yeah. can see if they go, I did not want to do this. Yeah. And I was forced to do it or, you know, or the implication was I would lose my job. And you go, well, that that's next and level. Nobody talks about it, Andy. That's yeah. the whole thing. You just are kind of, we don't have that built in to recognize this weakness in our profession. I, have you read that book, The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien? No, no. In tell me Vietnam? about that. Yeah, it's just, it's just, um, it's just a recollection. My daughter's reading it now in school. And I remember when I read it for the first time, I was completely overcome. But it's, it talks about morally injurious events among a platoon of um, Vietnam, uh, Vietnam warriors, you know, yeah. and it's, it really, I couldn't really articulate why it resonated with me so strongly. But I think sometimes I feel like we're, we're on a battlefield, you know, to, to expand on what you said, because I think it's what you said is so important. Pediatricians, because that's the easiest comparison, right? For okay. if you think about medical models. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah. Pediatricians have the right to advocate for their patients in their patient's best interest, even if it supersedes what the parent wants to do, which is unfortunately happening more and more you know, these days. Um, 
or the harm principle that if you elect a certain procedure, will it will it result in harm to your patient? And you know, it occurred to me that we don't have we don't have any of those protections in our shared decision making models. And you know, I'm lucky enough to practice in outside of Boston in an area where more and more people are getting pet insurance. Mm-hmm. And um the patient pet owner who's the proxy for the mm-hmm. pet. And I, in this triad of the pet patient, me as the provider and the the owner, the pet owner or you know pet pet parent, the three of us in that triad can engage in really productive shared decision making that doesn't elicit moral distress. Yeah. That would be the goal. Tell, tell me a little bit more about what you mean when you say pediatricians have a right to advocate. Like, what, what exactly does that mean as opposed to, I have a right to advocate, uh, meaning I can advocate all I want, but I can be ignored. What, what do you mean? Uh, what does that look like in human healthcare? I'm just not familiar enough w- yeah. with that. With they, that just have some, they just have legal protections. If they're struggling with a client, they can, most hospitals, can not, not the client, but the, the patient family. Mm-hmm. See, it's so hard to not, yeah. you know, Know, it's yeah. so hard to to not fall into that, um, but they can call an ethics committee. They have there are often ethics committees at hospitals, which will be typically teams of clinicians, nurses, psychologists, psychiatrists, all of whom have you know significant investment and time and intellectual investment in thinking about these exact issues. Yeah. So that's one thing, and there are legal protections. You can involve the law. We can't, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah, no, that 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 makes sense. Hey guys, I just want to jump in here with a couple quick updates. This week over on the Uncharted Veterinary Podcast, Stephanie Goss and I are talking about modernizing and updating an old school practice. If you have any interest in the advice we give to a manager who's like, hey, we got new ownership and now it's time to update and modernize the practice that we're in. How do we do that with the established team and culture? That is what Stephanie Goss and I unpack. I'll put a link in the show notes to the podcast, but you can get it wherever you get podcasts. That is the Uncharted Veterinary Podcast. Upcoming events, big ones. My dear, 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 dear friend, Jamie Holmes is doing a workshop on April 6th. It's called Put On Your Pants. P-A-N-T-S, how to hold meetings that matter. Uh, This is all about spending less time in meetings and more time getting effective results. If you, I don't know, happen to be kind of busy and uh, trying to get things done and you don't want to end up having a bunch of meetings to make that happen, you need to be efficient. You need to be effective. You need to know about the pants system. Jamie Holmes is going to teach you. That is 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific on April the 6th. Uh, That is free to Uncharted members, $99 to the public. I'll put a link in the show notes. And the other big one is um, the April Uncharted Conference. That is April 21st through the 23rd. That is live in person here in my hometown, Greenville, South Carolina. It is all about running smoother, more efficient, more rewarding practices. If you are a practice leader and you are looking for something to inspire you, to get you to see possibilities, to feel good about the work that you're doing again and to feel like, man, we could do interesting and amazing things in the future. Uh, If you need that feeling, come down to Greenville, South Carolina on the 21st through the 23rd for the April conference. Guys, uh, head over to the website. I'll put a link in the show notes. Get an Uncharted membership. Get in the conference. Come and check it out. It is uh, something magical. And it's almost full, too. We are almost sold out. I don't want you guys to miss the boat on that. So anyway, guys, that's enough. Let's get back into this episode. One of the questions I had for you coming in, um, you know, when I, I, I think a lot about wellness and sort of how we take care of ourselves. And I, I, I get pretty fired up um, when I see systems and protocols where individuals on the ground are called upon to make ethical or moral decisions in place of uh, some sort of a stated protocol. Yeah. And and I think the reason that people do that and our practices are set up that way. So, so I'll give you an example. Like when someone comes in and they say, my pet is sick and I need to be seen. And it's seven minutes before the clinic closes. <laughs> um, a lot of practices will say, well, the doctor gets to decide if they see the patient or not. Yeah. 
I have a problem with that because I feel like you're putting this moral decision on the individual. And if your wellness plan, if your plan to, to take care of your people in the long term and prevent burnout is people on the ground are going to look a crying pet owner in the eyes and and set a personal boundary, I think you're I think you're out of your mind. Like that's just not going to happen. It's not who we are. And so so I I really uh, am leaning into this idea of um, sometimes the kindest thing is to set boundaries and protocols at the practice level and say, we're going to take this moral decision or this this on the moment decision, we're going to take it off the shoulders of our staff, our employees, or we're going to make a decision at the practice level. And then that's just, they're not going to be called on to make this hard decision when half the staff, three quarters of the staff, they want to go home. And the doctor is looking at this person who wants to have their pet taken care of. And now either, whatever you choose, you're going to make someone upset. And I go, that's unnecessary stress that that just shouldn't be there there should be a plan of what happens and not a just a in the moment decision and so let me let me put that to you and sort of say do you believe that there are ways to reduce uh moral distress by having protocols in place or are we still in the same place of yeah just because there's a rule and this person doesn't get seen uh doesn't mean that i don't feel bad about it and i feel the same moral distress so help, help me with that is there is there yeah. value to having some sort of a set structure that takes some of these decisions off of the people on the ground absolutely um and i'm glad you said that because i mean i don't think i and i know you are the same way but i don't think i could have made it through this pandemic without my CSRs without my yeah. technicians. I mean, they, and I'm just going to shout out to VCA Brookline Animal Hospital because <laughs> they are my family. We're a family. Um, and in many ways, my God, they have been, they're the ones who walk out to the car and get the pet yeah. from the car. They're the one, they have worked so hard. Um, I'm going to like start to cry, but I just, <laughs> um, they're, so, you know, and I, I think, we are we are buoyed by them, and a lot of what we're talking yeah. about. Um, and I want to say this to all the all the technicians, all the all the non veterinarians who functions part of our team. This is all equally about you. Yeah. This is, if not more, this mm -hmm. is we're all together. Nurses were the ones who this concept was first intellectually recognized. So. I just want to emphasize the importance of taking care of that staff. Yeah, I, I think that's that's really important to say, right? Because I'm coming at this very much, you and I both being veterinarians, uh, you know, we come from a veterinarian centric mindset. But the truth right. is, we have much more autonomy and agency in these situations than my technicians or, or the CSRs who that's are right. just told this, go tell, go tell them no. And then they're really put in this tight position. And, you know, I, I again, I, I, th I feel like that's a, sometimes a manifestation of that whole, like we, we haven't set protocols, we don't have plans. And so then the plan is have the front desk go tell them no, because it sounds better coming from them than it does coming from the doctor. And I go, well, that's, that's right. That's awful. You know, like that, that takes a human toll. It takes a human toll on, on our support staff. It really does. And, and I, I'm, I mean, I, I'm so glad you said that. I do think that I do think, and I, I'm working on this right now, actually. So I'll share more next time we talk. But I, yeah. because I'm just trying to get something together. But there is a, uh, she just passed away. She's a philosopher named Renee Fox. And she wrote a lot about medical ethics education. Okay. And reading her, she talks about infusing, we have such a dichotomy in clinical aspects of a case and non-clinical aspects of a case to our detriment, honestly, Andy, to our huge detriment, because I think we have to consider each case and each clinical situation holistically. And we are better off for it if we start to recognize the potential ethical situations implicit in each case. Someone comes in, doesn't have cash, you know, just adopted this dog, doesn't have financial means, no insurance, mother is ill with a chronic disease in the hospital. I mean, you hear that. We hear that. We smush all that information in our heads. Our technicians are sad because they heard that. And then we don't really do anything with it. We try our best to harness our empathy, our skills. You know, we're kind of MacGyverish in the way that we try to maximize good clinical outcomes for our patients. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But then we take it home and then I'm trying to sleep and I'm like, oh my God, 
I can't stop thinking about this. Wouldn't it be great if we had some ability to take these this information and be considering it along with all the clinical considerations? And I, I'll say that I'm trying to think of a way that maybe we can do that. And at least articulating that information among our team will help us deal with it going forward. Are you talking more about about having good ways to discuss these types of stressors with your team inside the clinic? Or are you talking more about having this way to discuss sort of, um, say, across, say, veterinarians, uh, you know, across multiple practices or, or some sort of external support structure? Uh, or are you talking more about, about training in veterinary schools to, to sort of help people have better vocabulary to explain where they are, what their what their stressors are so this thing could be addressed. Help me understand what exactly, yeah. where, where are you coming down there? Um, I mean, you're so perceptive because that's exact. it's all of those things, right? I read somewhere that when you're trying to, um, and I have to find the reference for this, uh, when you're trying to ameliorate the effects of moral distress, it has to be at the clinical situation. So yeah. with the patient at hand, in the institution, in the organization, in the profession. Yeah. So it's multi, multi-leveled. Yeah. I, I like that a lot. I, I, I've, I've, you know, when people ask me about, about burnout and, and what do we do about, about the problem, you know, with suicide or, or, or depression or, um, you know, just, just a high turnover, things like that in the profession. To me, it's gotta be a multi-level approach, yeah. right? And so I, I talk about the, I think there's things we do at the professional level, uh, at the, at the practice level is, is really the boundaries and, and systems I was talking about before of like, and take these, this weight off of the individual. And, and there is, ultimately, there really is never going to be a way around this where there's not yeah. agency that has to be taken at the personal level. Like, we are all going to have to figure out how we process we are. What, what we deal with. And we, all, and we also are going to need to set some amount of personal boundaries for ourselves. But God, if the whole program, the whole yeah. wellness program is the individual will process these things and set personal yeah. boundaries, that's, that's baloney. That's, that's, that doesn't that's work. And that's what's happening right now, I think. This is my, you know, informal anecdotal perception is that we have to, there's nothing weak in looking at our profession under the microscope and saying, right. what, are, what are we doing wrong? What are we doing wrong? We have to make the change. Otherwise, quite honestly, I I worry that, you know, what what's going to happen to our workforce? It's interesting. I have a brilliant, um, one of my fellowship mates is a psychologist. And okay. I, pre I presented some of this stuff to my group. And um, she's so articulate, but she said, you know, it feels like you're a profession in slow degradation in some ways. And I didn't like hearing that because it made me very, very, very sad. But it also made me feel empowered. And I said, okay, if we are a field in slow degradation, we're not doing something right. What can we do? We yeah. have to do something else. So take something which seems ominous and start to say we need to look at this in a different way yeah. and make it because my because you know like I love this profession, Andy. I still when I go to work, I'm like excited to see. Yeah. See, you know, I I I really love it. I love it, and yeah. I, I would like to help it. I would like us to help it, but it will require us to be self-critical as a profession and not put it on the agency of our members to have these little dots of fixing it. We have to fix it on mass. You know, I, I, I completely agree with that. I, I love, I love that medicine. I love being a veterinarian. I, 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 but, but I will, but I mean, let me push back against you a little bit here and say, yeah. Andrew, I, I feel I, I'm positive about where we're going. Um, I, again, I, I really am. What what most inspired me about what you're talking about is, my friend, what you write, like you're part of the diagnostic process. And like, we know how to figure this out, right? The first thing you do is you die, you, you run a diagnostics and you say, where is the pain coming from? Right? What is, what is, what, as quickly as we can drill into it, what are the actual things that are causing this to happen? And then, but once you've got the diagnosis, you know, tr usually the treatment part, uh, comes can come along much better. I, I feel I feel like for the last ten years we have um, we have been in a degradation slide. But I, and I also think our perception of where we are has been has been. I don't want to say it, it's been counterproductive. I, I think the truth in, in the modern world when we when, it, when we deal with problems, especially in the world of social media and the internet, 
Step one is awareness of the problem. Yeah. And I think that we have really lived in awareness. And I think ultimately that's, that's a good thing. But talking and about... situation too. Exactly right. Bit. Yeah. I, I yeah. completely agree. So, yeah. so we start off and people are like, you know, hey, burnout is terrible and we're having these problems and we're having high turnover and and um, and the suicide rate for, for veterinarians and veterinary technicians is high. And, and, and all those things are true. And we do need to raise awareness. Of those. I, think, I think that we've done that. And I think where I am and I think where a lot of people in the industry are is, is I go, okay, I, it's time to transition into some better yeah. diagnostics and yep. then into a multimodal treatment approach. And, and I feel Absolutely. like when I read your piece and I'm like moral distress, I go, that's a diagnostic I didn't have. That yep. helps me, that helps me articulate the problem and exactly what's going on in a way that I think can help our profession to exactly. develop ways to approach it. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not down. I, I, I feel like work that, that people like you do, um, you know, uh, so Jim Brandt, uh, Carrie Journey has been on the podcast recently. And like, I, I think that we're shifting this paradigm uh, from the awareness to the uh, to the diagnostic part and then, then on to the treatment part. And Something so I, actionable. Yeah, I, I think that that's I do. I see I do see this as as more of an actionable step or a pathway to actionable steps. And so that's that's why that's why I, I am I am optimistic. But I do. Yeah. I mean, I do agree. That I, I still, I still love being a vet. And, and I think these are worthy challenges. And I think we can love being veterinarians and we can be critical. We should be. Profession. I mean, we, yeah, we should be. Because, you know, if we, if we don't, if we don't progress and evolve, even in the past two years, the profession has really changed the demand on veterinarians right now. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, my, my God, in my life, Angel Memorials here in Boston, they've gone on diversion a few times. Well, we have to, they're referring out, you know, Angel Memorial yeah. is referring away from, and I'm sure you're seeing that too, um, where you are, Andy. It's, but it's, I agree. And I, and yes, there's no, there's no reason to dwell in the misery. We have to look for the light. And I love how you made this a clinical case diagnostics and <laughs> therapeutics, but it's absolutely true. And so, you know, that's where I'm looking right now and focusing on some of my next research is thinking about some solutions that we might be able to implement. Yeah. Completely. No, I, I, I think that's wonderful. I uh, said, I, I do see it as a diagnostic. I, I think, I think for me, where I really start to think about moral distress and where it's super helpful is, you know, I would sit and I'd wrestle with these things and I would say, you know, burnout's a problem and it's stressful and, and vet medicine is stressful and we've got these things. But then I would turn around and I would say, first line healthcare responders have a stressful job. Oh, and I'm yeah. sure they feel, and, and social service workers have a stressful job and they feel, I mean, sure they feel this this as well. And I, mean, I have a friend who's a pediatric palliative care specialist. I mean, she helps children in pain with cancer. I'm like, oh my God. And yeah. so we we don't have the market cornered on on pain we don't but i still but i believe and this is why i like the way you put it so much i believe that we have a special kind of pain that is different yes. often from from what other people feel and yes. i just think that that you unlock that in my mind and that's why i was like this is this is this is so useful oh yeah and we andy we don't we have a special kind of pain and we don't really have ways professionally to handle that pain or to you know we don't have those what do they look like? I mean, so, 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 okay. So what, when you gaze into your crystal ball and you say five, 10 years down the road and you say, yeah, when we continue to work on these things, what, what, are, what are some of those mechanisms look like? Help me, help me understand. Um, uh, what, what, what could a, what could a, a, to stick with our metaphor, what could a treatment program look like theoretically? I mean, I, I wonder if we start to recognize and outline situations, you know, um, even as, pedestrian as it seems, it, maybe we have clinical situations that are that we teach our students about, we implement in practice. As pedestrian as it seems, if somebody came over and said, I want you to declaw my cat, mm -hmm. you're not scratching anything, but I want you to declaw. I want you to declaw. And we can talk about what that elicits in the veterinarian. Yeah. What that try to explain to the client why that elicits moral distress in the veterinarian to be forced to do something like that. You yeah. know, cosmetic procedures, the very existence of, you know, brachycephalic dogs. And, you know, I, I love all my little Frenchies and all, sure. the, all the guys that come in, 
But I do find sometimes that the clients are somewhat bewildered by the inevitable <laughs> slew of medical issues that will follow. Mm-hmm. And 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 we'll sometimes take it out on us, you know, mm-hmm. be upset, be angry. And even something like that, education of the client, why this elicits moral distress um, in the veterinarian to have these discussions, all of that can potentially help. Yeah, I, I that makes a lot of sense to me. I, I, I do see real value in that. One of the things I really like about sort of your approach and kind of where you're putting this, I, I see a lot of people who push and say, well, we need to put this on the clients or we need to make clients aware of how they come across. And I get it. As a pragmatist, I go, I, I don't I don't know that we're going to talk clients into behaving differently than they behave. And, and no way. Oh, I, yeah. I, I, I do feel like it has to be on us. And it's not fair that I have to build, feel the burden or figure out a coping strategy for a pet owner that's going to be verbally abusive or they're upset because of this thing that they should not be asking me to do or pushing me to do. Um, it sucks that I'm the one who has to figure that out. But yeah. I, I, I think it's, I do think it's true. And I think if we push back and go, well, you need to tell that client to go stuff it. Um, I, I don't, I know, I, I, I said, I said, stuff it today. I said, I, I said, I called something baloney. Like I, I'm aging. Yeah, you sound from 1950. I do. I yeah. I'm like a yeah. 1950s, 1950s radio host. Guy. Oh my, no, I mean, you're What's happening completely, me? you're completely right though. And you know, sometimes I see things on social media, be kind to your vet. And that's a great sentiment. But we can't, that can't be our, that can't be our, our, our crutch here. We can't. Right. That's, not, that's not the go-to not, strategy. Yeah. No, we can't do that. And, you know, um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I like, you know, I've seen a bad, I saw, had a bad Yelp review a few years ago. And like, I was, you know, um, apparently I was too pushy with asking for diagnostics. And I was, you know, I was, I was very upset. I like yeah. separated on it. I I bugged my poor husband and he was like, why do you care? And I was like, I care, I care. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I'll tell you why you care, right? Because it's, it's, at some point it's your personal identity and you take this yeah. seriously. And, and right. I would also say that's the moral trap, right? Is oh, yes. if you feel yeah. like this is what should happen and you advocate for it and then someone publicly slams you for doing what you think is right, you're really in a no-win job. situation, right? Like Absolutely. Absolutely. you either don't do what you think is important And, you know, because you might, you might antagonize this person or you might upset them or you might make them a little bit uncomfortable or you do what you think is right. And then you get sort of publicly hammered for it and you go, and I don't have an answer for that. The only thing that makes you feel better with that, and that's, this is what I wonder about harnessing is it helps me when I like, you know, with that review, I went to um, two veterinarians I was working with that day and I was like, can you believe this? Look at this. (laughs) What is this? And, you know, they were like, oh, my God, that's awful. Blah. But, you know, it's again, that was a mini. It was like just a snapshot of what we could do as a profession to buoy one yeah. another up in those situations. You know, no, that's a great point. You know, the validation and support from yeah. from our colleagues is super important. And we're not going to we're not going to get that validation from pet owners. They just don't understand. No yeah. They, yeah. You know, they just they no, just don't. Some we will. I think there's some I mean, we both have amazing pet owners, you know, who, who, who do that. But one thing, this is random, but I have to tell you, Andy, that the advent of insurance and more people adopting pet insurance, it has to me has helped my patient population in terms of ameliorating these dilemmas a little bit, you know? Yeah, I, I do agree. I think reducing that, uh, that threshold, uh, that resource scarcity threshold. Yeah, that that's, that's a big part of it. Most, most pet owners are are totally happy to follow our recommendations if, if they have the resources to do so. And, and, and I don't want to leave this as vilifying pet owners in some way, because I I think, I think we're all sort of doing our best. It's, um, it's, 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 it's a challenge. Anyway, Indumani, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thanks for talking with me. This is so great. Thank you, Andy. It's so gr- I mean, I think about many of our ridiculous conversations that we've had. Many, many ridiculous conversations. And yeah. it's kind of hilarious that we're having a more significant one. <laughs> I miss seeing you at conferences because you and I have business suits that look almost identical. Remember that? We, like we, yes. we have 
We we both have gray businesses. We were twin. That we were twinning so and similar. The, and the and it had like a cranberry colored shirt or something. <laughs> Do you remember? Yeah. We okay, showed up, and I we showed, showed up wearing the same thing. Yeah. And then I have to tell you, I showed my technicians that, and they were like, <laughs> "You know, Dr. Andy Rourke." <laughs> it was so, so awesome. Oh man! Well, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm going to drop the links from our conversation into the show notes for people who want to see them. Um, Andrew, I can't wait to see what you do next. Thanks for all the work you're doing for VetMass. Thank you, Andy, and vice versa. And that is our episode. Guys, that's what we got for you. Thanks so much for being here. I have to stop for a second and give a shout out to my friends at Banfield Vet Hospital for uh, supporting our transcripts. We have transcripts of the podcast now in an effort to increase inclusivity and accessibility. Banfield has reached out and they were like, hey, let's make this thing happen. Let's make this thing accessible to everybody. And they have made possible transcripts of both the Uncharted Veterinary Podcast and this here Kona Shane Veterinary Podcast. So special thanks to them. Guys, you can find it uh, uh, over on drandywork.com uh, and uh, you can find transcripts for all of our podcasts linked to them there. So guys, um, anyway, just wanted to say thanks. And I want to say thanks to you for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, if you got something out of it, please feel free to leave us an honest review wherever you get podcasts. It really is how people find the show and it means the world to me. So guys, that's it. Take care of yourselves. Be well. Talk to you later. Bye.